12 o'clock, let's uh, continue with the next talk, which is going to be given by Daniel Barlow, and it's going to be about NixWRT, which is a uh, collection of derivations uh, to basically build uh, to build I, uh, to build flash images from Wes to flash yes, your yes. to flash your network driver and hopefully not brick it. Um, so yeah, uh, give him a round of applause and uh, enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, my name is Daniel Barlow. I'm here to talk about um, using the Nix package collection to build images for embedded routers, um, IoT devices, things like this little widget here, which you can't see, but don't worry, there's pictures. I'd like to start by saying welcome to London. Um, there's a nice iconic image here of Piccadilly Square with one of our London black cabs in it. Um, if you're not local, you might not know. Um, they have to take a, a knowledge test. They have to memorize every road name within six miles of Charing Cross before they're allowed to drive one of these cars. Um, unfortunately, uh, you can't see the contrast quite so well there. This is my iconic black X1 ThinkPad carbon after a black cab driver ran over it the other week. So. <laughs> Um, it doesn't boot anymore, surprisingly enough. Um, yeah, so um, any any problems with the the quality or the polish in this talk, that's what I'm blaming is on. So yeah, NixWRT or NixWRT. Um, I came up with the name like six months ago, and only just today realised I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, I'm going to go with NixWRT, but I'm not going to be standard about it. So. When I started out with it, it was an experiment to see if I could use the Nix package collection to build um, uh, uh, images for Wi-Fi routers of the kind you usually run OpenWrt or DDWRT or Tomato, that kind of thing on. Um, show of hands, I mean, who's got one of these things at home? Who's tried flashing their router at home? Fair few people, yeah. Okay, so um, this isn't Nixos on your router. Um, the image you get out of it is just an image. It's immutable. Um, you, you can't log into it and, and you know, um, compile packages or anything like that. So it's got no compilers. Um, yeah. So why? Last November, I built a new uh, computer for my home office. Uh, you see it there. It's not actually on fire. It's got LEDs inside it. Um, and I wanted to be able to back it up. Um, didn't want to build another computer with backup host because that feels a bit sort of recursive. So I've got a USB disk drive. I've got a spare router with a USB port. So well, what if, you know, I, I know there's some kind of um, embedded Linux thing inside that router. Maybe I can repurpose that and get some use out of it instead of throwing it into e-waste. Um, why not use OpenWRT? And the first thing I have to say here is OpenWRT is great. Um, and there's so much work gone into it. Uh, so many people working on different random problems which you would never even hope to be able to replicate as a, as a small developer. Um, you know, I didn't realize how great it was until I tried bringing the, the mainstream Nix Linux kernel up on a MIPS device and found I had no Ethernet driver. Um, and a router with no Ethernet driver is a little bit... <laughs> it doesn't root much. Um, yeah. Uh, however, I'm not going to be telling anyone anything you don't already know, but when you're talking about divergent, convergent, and congruent change management, OpenWRT is on the left-hand end of the scale to a big extent. Um, you know, you have um, 60 billion different packages in OpenWRT. Uh, you install them imperatively by typing commands on the thing itself. Then you configure it using a GUI. Uh, six months later, um, you know, you upgrade the firmware, or the router blows up and you need new hardware, or your ISP says, try factory recessing it. Uh, and can you remember everything you did? Um, maybe some people are diligent enough to back these things up properly, um, but I'm certainly not. So I got to thinking, you know, maybe there is a more general problem to be solved here than just somewhere safe to store my RIP CDs. Uh, so, yeah, did some hacking, did some blogging, uh, got distracted, got distracted again, got my laptop crushed, and, and, you know, managed to crash my own home network in several different fun ways. Um, here we are a year on. Um, is it done? There's a little bit of scope creep. Um, I did the backup server. The backup server is working fine. That's great. You know, I, I did what I came for. Um, I repurposed the, the wireless range extender in my study upstairs um, to run NixWRT as well. Um, 
The router downstairs, which is the one that actually connects to broadband, I'm still working on that. Uh, take over the world is kind of a stretch goal. Um, and the other question, I said it was an experiment, so you know, what, what were the findings, I guess? Uh, is Nix good for this stuff? And emphatically, yes, it is. Um, okay, I'm kind of preaching to the converted. Um, but <laughs> the, the Nix language, I mean, it's, it, you know, compared to anything else I've used in terms of you know, configuration management or, or building is, is superb. Um, Everyone knows that. The cross-compilation stuff, uh, you might not know unless you've been involved with it, but um, as of sort of beginning of 2018, uh, a lot of work being done last year on cross-compilation in Nix, uh, and it's, uh, it's really made it easy to build NIP, MIPS um, binaries from an x86 system. Uh, and the support for, for Muzzle, which is or, um, an alternative C library to the Vue C library, it's smaller and faster and more compliant, and works better on embedded systems and um, I mean I, th I, th I think that's pretty new as well um, it's certainly the case that I've hardly ever hit problems trying to use a C library that's not the good C library so on those three counts uh, MIPS it, uh, sorry on those three counts Nix is pretty awesome um, overlays um, again you know you could there were various ways of customizing derivations before overlays came in um, but having a consistent way of doing it as reasonably principled is is really useful and really helpful for making packages smaller. And I'll talk a bit lot more about that in a minute. Uh, so, um, yeah, there are things I have learned along the way uh, that if you wanted to, to to get into it, you would also end up learning sooner or later. Um, you know how to read and write Nix derivations. Stuff about Linux, stuff about how the kernel is put together, things about networks, switches, TCP, Ethernet, what's a Mac, what's a Fi, um, overlays, uh, fixed points. Uh, fixed points are awesome. I, I, I know enough to hand wave about them. I don't know enough to explain them. So I'm going to do some hand waving in a minute. Um, if you have enough coffee, the rest of it is easy. Uh, so, so what do you ne actually need? Um, obviously, you need some kind of um, thing to run it on. Um, this is the GLINET MT300N, which is like GLINET MT300A, but it's a different color. It's slightly cheaper, um, and the hardware inside it's slightly different. Um, so, you know, these things, these are not your typical PCs. Uh, they're smaller, they're slower. Um, no graphics hardware, so you establish a console connection to it by attaching three wires to it, which is more or less complicated depending on whether there are pin headers there to attach them to or you need to go and um, do some bad soldering. Um, obviously, the, the architecture is different. It runs some variety of MIPS, um, um, or the, the ones I've tried so far do anyway. I guess some people are using ARM for this stuff. Um, you don't boot from the BIOS or from UEFI. You don't use Grub. You use a thing called U-Boot, which I'll be showing you in a minute. Um, and the way the, the particular board knows about all the bits that are in it, like you know where the GPIO pins are, where the LEDs are, um, how to make the, the, the Ethernet, or how to initialize the, the little um, network switch inside it. Um, on a grown-up computer like a PC, you've got things like ACPI, where it can sort of go and enumerate the bus and um, find out where all the things are, because all the things will say, look, I'm over here. Um, on these older, smaller systems, either that knowledge is compiled into the kernel for the particular board you're using, um, or on some varieties, a, thing called a device tree, which is basically a, a data file uh, with the same information in it. So we abstracted that code into data. Um, the device tree is a better way of doing it, um, but not all ports have been updated to use it yet. Um, yeah, so in terms of Nix WRT, if you wanted to play with it, the best supported boards are the ones based on the AR9330 uh, or, or the, the ones based on the MediaTek um, socks. Um, and I say the, 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 the blue one and the yellow one are both cheap and both easy to get hold of. Uh, and. Uh, also, no soldering required. Um, you just pop the top off. Um, is there an emulator? 
Um, QEMU works, but it, the hardware emulates not very much like the real hardware. Um, testing on the real hardware is actually not that bad. So, um, obviously you need to connect it together to something. Um, <laughs> this, this is my test setup. It's a little mo bit more Baroque than it needs to be. Um, that, that you'll see is the, the device itself uh, with uh, three cables coming out of it for the serial console. Serial console is TTL level logic. It runs into something which understands that. In my case, at the moment, that's a Raspberry Pi um, because I blew up my serial cable. Um, and then that, that is the, the, the most overkill use ever of an Arduino YUN, um, which basically exists to toggle the USP power off and off so when I wedge it solid, um, I can turn it off and on again uh, without having to go upstairs uh, and uh, pull the USB cable out. Um, so I'm going to do a little demonstration of, of what it looks like to, to build on or what the actual hardware looks like. I'm not going to demo it on this, this thing here because it would take too long to plug everything together. I'm going to attempt to SSH in my system at home and show you it there. Um, you ask what could go wrong, well, this guy here, actually, uh, my son has got to the age where he really likes turning the power on or off in the front of the machine. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully it's still there when we get there. We're just about to go and find out. Um, right. No. That's not either, is it? Ah, it was that one. Okay. So let's have 80 columns as the good Lord intended. Um, my handle on most online system is Talent, um, which I chose a long time ago because I couldn't type Telnet correctly without typoing it. Uh, so the, the host name theme is, uh, is all typos as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, here we are. Um, I'm going to start by making it. Um, and it does nothing, of course, because I made it last night to check that everything worked. Um, <laughs> and, and therefore, there's nothing to be done. Um, so, there's a little make file, um, just because there's an awful lot of parameters to give to Nick builds. Um, so, it's a particular um, derivation we're using, I'll show you that in a minute, it's called backup host. We're building a target called Framware. Um, various parameters we're passing it for things like SSH keys and an rsync password and, and other stuff. And you'll see it has eventually built um, a, a file in that directory there. Um, and then it's rsynced it into my TFTP server directory. And I'm just going to show you that. Um, Um, so yeah, there it is. So that, that is my firmware file, which is about four and a half megabytes in size, uh, which is okay for that particular target device. Um, put that back in the stand. Good. Um, So I'm going to introduce some insignificant white space into one of these derivations. Oh, that's nice. No, all right, I'll come back to that bit. Um, ah, here we are. So this is, is that volume level okay for everyone? Yeah. Um, so this is the, the device itself. Um, I'm connected to it over an SSH section, over an SSH section, over uh, a Minicom serial session, um, over the three wires you saw in the picture um, into the actual the hardware device. I'm just going to reset it just to show you it's there, and I'm going to stop auto boot. Um, so this is this thing called U boot. Um, it's the universal bootloader. Um, it, it's called the universal bootloader. What actually happens is that um, hardware manufacturers take it, fork it, um, hack it up, um, burn it onto their machines, 
Um, getting a new version of U-Boot onto your device is a bit like trying to put Core Boot onto your um, your laptop. Um, it's it can be done, but if it goes wrong, you need JTAG debuggers and stuff like that. So, generally speaking, uh, the one you've got is you know the one you're going to live with, um, unless you want to get more complicated than I've got. Um, so anyway, you've got a collection of uh, commands in U-Boot here, um, which do things like print the environment variable, boot, change memory addresses, uh, let you do things with flash and so on. Um, so if I just do print env, they are more or less uh, defective depending on the manufacturer. Um, so, you know, in theory, if you've done a proper good install of U-Boot, then um, this environment will be writable and you can change the parameters here. Um, often you'll find that the hardware manufacturer just hard-coded the environment and you can't actually save anything, uh, which is uh, annoying, um, but not insuperable. So, I'm gonna uh, boot this device, um, and I'm gonna do it the slightly cheesy way uh, by inserting a file um, empty boot.script because there's about five or six lines I have to type uh, to get it to boot from RAM. Oh, okay, off it goes. Okay, and, and then it's doing exciting stuff. Um, just going back through the uh, scroll back here in Tmux. Quite a lot of it. So what did it do? These are all U-boot commands it's typing in. Um, it's booting the TFTP. Um, it's boot, there, there's the TFTP command. It's copying it into a particular start address, which is carefully chosen not to clash with anything else. Uh, and then the bootm command is boot from memory. So there you see the TFTV happening. There it's loading the thing down. Uh, that's where it's, sorry, I'm pointing at my screen instead of your screen. <laughs> um, that's, that's the actual where Linux actually starts happening and starting kernel and the rest of it is all Linux. And there it is. And just to show you that we're not in x86 anymore, um, yes, it is running root shell on the console. Um, this could be considered a security problem uh, if your threat model includes people prying the covers off and attaching three wires to the... Uh <laughs> that can be configured, of course. Um, so there we are. It's a MediaTek MT67620, GL3 MT200A. It's running on a MIPS. It's 385 bogger MIPS if they count for anything anymore and, and various other stuff there. Um, That concludes the demonstration, I think, probably. So how does it work? Um, I don't know if any of that writing is readable from where anyone is sitting. <laughs> it surprisingly took longer to draw that than I thought it was going to. Um, so what I'd like you to focus on here is this is a, a, a description of the build process. Um, this is our output at the bottom, which is the firmware binary that we just saw being TFTP booted. Um, in that image, you've got a kernel image, which is this U image thing here. You've got a file system image for the root file system, and the two of them basically just splatted together with DD. Um, the file system image is generated from a configuration, which is a Nix uh, value I'll show you in a moment. Uh, which has got, it's an actual set with um, various different things you want to go into your image, and the image builder then makes the image out of it. Um, some of the things, I'm going to talk about modules in a minute. I know a lot of people talk about modules. They, these aren't Nixos modules, these are something else. I named them badly. Um, so you start with an empty configuration, you apply modules to it until you've got the config you want, and then you send it into the builder and it builds your image. Uh, some of the things in your some of the things in your configuration are package references. So we also set Nix package answers there. Uh, we've got an overlay to make them smaller and um, kinder, and so on. Uh, the other half of the picture is the kernel build, 
which comes from the kernel.org, the upstream, it also comes from OpenWRT. Uh, they get merged together, it gets built, uh, we get the VM Linux file out of it. We stick the device tree into it, which is the data file I was telling you about earlier. That gets you the bootable image, and so that's the, the other half of the output there. So I think the three things in that picture which you would have to touch if you're hacking on this are um, the package overlay uh, for including packages and making sure your packages are going to build on it, uh, the module system, which is badly named, and potentially the kernel build if you want to get detailed about it. And we're going to have a look at each of those. Um, so there's good news. There's lots of good news. Uh, lots of these packages already just works, which is awesome. Uh, we quite often have to patch uh, our packages um, because we're not using the standard C library. Uh, some things don't cross-compile, so we need to disable the, cross cross the, the, the do-check clauses where they're in if they're um, unconditional. Uh, sometimes you get very big closures. Uh, Moko was talking about big closures yesterday, and I really feel it on this thing because you're, you know, we have a limit, very limited amount of flash space. It can be as little as four megabytes. Um, you don't want to be getting one and a half gigabytes of Firefox in there. Um, so there are various hacks we've done to um, you know, remove library dependencies for optional features where the original derivation included them, um, get rid of shell scripts that depend on bash because bash is a huge... Um, yeah, uh, if all those fails, just run strings and grep for nix store. That's, uh, that's a good way of finding... Uh, um, uh, leaky uh, bits in your closures. Make sure you stripped everything, and we also slightly hacked up the squashFS generation to remove static libraries from the generated output because who is ever going to use those when you don't have a compiler? Um, so here's an example. Um, this is one of the entries in our package overlay uh, for the host app daemon. As you see, it's based on the upstream one Linux packages. We've overrided the SQLite attribute because we don't need it. We've uh, sorry, the, uh, the SQLite parameter we've overridden. Then we want to override the attributes as well, and we said we don't want extra config, and we're going to use uh, this um, configure file, which we generated here, instead of using what the uh, the Nix packages one does. Uh, and that's uh, that's a huge saving on host app D, and that's how I've got a, a wireless extender running in for megs of flash. Um, modules, not the Nixos module system. Uh, we've had a lot this week, this couple of days about the module system. Uh, the chief reason for writing it differently was that it seemed like fun. Um, middlewares might be a better name. Um, a module is a function which applies to a configuration and generates new configuration. Um, and we apply them repeatedly in the same kind of um, pattern as overlays do, except we're applying them to the configuration rather than applying them to, to the next package derivation. Um, so your configuration object, um, that's really bad. I don't have a picture of the configuration object. Um, ooh, wow. Skip forward a little bit there. What's it doing? Hey, right, okay. <laughs> There's reveal.js. It's, it's three-dimensional slide navigation. It's funky. Um, so the essence of it is that in your um, derivation, you'll start with the base configuration, which has almost nothing in it. It has empty arrays of files, packages, um, some other stuff. Um, you will then apply each module in sequence to it. So that's the hardware module for the device. Um, that's in going to include an rsync server. That's going to include an SSH server. Uh, that's going to include BusyBox, which is pretty fundamental. Uh, this particular device is my backup host, so it's got a USB disk uh, module in it uh, with some parameters. Uh, there's some stuff for the kernel. There's some stuff for configuring the network switch, which is integrated into the device. And you know, we're running syslogd. We're running NTPD. We're running a DHCP client. Um, and to build the firmware, we merge all the modules together uh, and pass it to the firmware generation function, and there's our firmware.bin. Um, 
The modules themselves actually look uh, like this. You see the whole uh, um, fixed point pattern up here with itself in the super. Um, la 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 la. So that's our um, parent module. Uh, we're adding a service called HostAppD. We're adding the HostAppD package, and we're adding a. F this is right down at the bottom. I don't know if anyone can see over over his head. Right down at the bottom, we're adding a file called etc. .hostapd.psk, uh, which has also got um, some content and a mode in it. And those files are written into Flash, same as everything else. Um, Oh, I'm running out of time to talk about adding new hardware devices, which is great because this is the complicated bit, and I'm going to skim through it. Um, uh, new hardware devices, I've, I think I've had it running on four different devices so far, which are all sort of one or two of the various MIPS families. It is much, much, much easier if it already works in OpenWRT. In fact, I wouldn't even bother trying it unless you want a project to, to try and build for something that isn't in OpenWRT already. Uh, there's kind of things you'll expect to have to do. is find out what stock family it runs on. Is it uh, Atheros? Is it an RA link? Is it a MediaTek? Is it something else? Because uh, that's going to um, impact whether it uses a device tree or something else. Um, find out how to attach a serial cable to it. I've burnt one router by doing some really bad soldering on it already. Um, as I say, does it use a device tree? And then you find, you find out things like where, is, where in memory is the flash? Um, how do I configure the network switch such that the Ethernet in the kernel actually gets out to the box? Um, all of this information for all the supported devices is in the file called devices.nix, um, and there's a lot of commentary in there as well. Um, if you are minded to do your own device, you would do that. Um, and yeah, if you can cobble together something to turn its power on and off remotely, you'll find remote development a lot easier for, for the early stages to bring up. Um, I can I can show you my Arduino. It's not pretty, um, but it was stuff I had around. Um, so future plans. Um, obviously, the first thing to do um, is to finish the PPP over Ethernet supports because then I can actually run it on my primary router at home, uh, which the family will love, I'm sure, when it starts crashing. Um, better story for upgrades. Um, I've got a plan um, for upgrading without having to flash it every time. Um, Better story for the first time support, which doesn't involve attaching cables to the device. Um, that's going to depend on the device because you know your vendor firmware may allow you to upgrade freely or may have restrictions on the format. So that's going to be a bit of fun working it out. And a better story for, for secrets. Um, so at the moment, we, um, we don't put secrets in the Nix store on the build machine. I've been quite careful about that um, because I check that into GitHub. Um, but they do end up burned into the image. Uh, and if you want to change your password, then you end up having to reflash the image, which doesn't feel quite right. Um, so design something which will get them from a writable file system or over a network or something else. I can quite see the appeal of uh, network-based secrets if you're managing a, a, a decent-sized fleet of devices. Um, and perhaps even get some users, because at the moment it's just me. Um, so that's it. Um, two minutes for questions. Uh, ask me anything. I may not know the answer. I probably hand wave. All righty. Thank you for your talk. Who has got questions? Yes, we've got a question. I have a pile of WRT 5.4 GL routers up in my attic. Is the four megabytes of RAM, is that, it looked like your image was a little bit bigger. Is there a little bit more that could be cut to get this running on them? That image is, is bigger than the small, the smallest feature I have running has four megabytes of flash, uh, and that's the wireless extender upstairs. I had to work quite hard to get it into four, four megs, but things can be done with the four meg image, yeah. More people with stuff in their basement. Sorry. Hello. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm wondering about uh, uh, whether we can implement DM Verity onto this DM Verity, like the Merkle hash trees, just to check the um, hashes of the file system. It's not something I thought about. Um, it would be a good idea. Yeah. 
Another question? Nope. Then, then thank you very much again for your wonderful talk. Thank you. Next 